PokerStatic.com. We bring you the interviews you want to hear. Now with your host, Brett Oliverio and Eric Bickle, the Poker Static Hot Seat. What's up? Welcome to the Poker Static Hot Seat. Brett Oliverio with Eric Bickle. Joining us tonight is Donnie Stern. You know him as Ansky. Donnie, what's happening? Not too much. How you guys doing? Now, you're coming to us from New York City, correct? That's right. You can tell by so you, the white walls in my apartment, yes. right? So do you, have your own, do you have your own spot there, right there in the city? Where exactly uh, do you live? Uh, I live sort of in uh, Murray Hill. It's like a really... Jappy neighborhood of Manhattan, a lot of uh, like a lot of Long Island Jews and and douchebag eye bankers. <laughs> Perfect. How long have you been there? Uh, I've lived here since since I didn't graduate from college. Um, so I guess like <laughs> almost three years now. Now, is it you and a bunch of guys, or is it just you? Um, I live with two other guys, one of whom is a poker player. You m may know him by his 2 plus 2 infamy, this NYC baller. He's ah, okay. sort of just, you know, yeah, he's, I don't know if you guys know. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I'm familiar with the name, but I don't know, like, what, what games he plays or anything. Oh, it's not really what the games he plays. It's more about his, uh, you know, two plus two shtick that's gotten him famous. Gotcha. <laughs> bit, bit, now, bit later. now, now, why don't you live in Vegas? You know, I mean, that's sort of what would jump out at me. You know, Ansky should be in Vegas, right? I, I don't, I, I don't really like living in Vegas. I mean, I, I'm there in the summer, you know, for two months, and I probably spend another month there during the year. So I still spend probably about a quarter of my time there. But, I mean. New York is home. I grew up here. Uh, I can never. I, I really can never live in Vegas. I don't think it would be right. It's just too much to live there year round. The good thing is, though, every time you go out there, it seems like you come back with a big score, right? The last two World Series for you have been pretty profitable. Why don't you talk about that? Mm, yeah, I had two two pretty good World Series. Um, uh, last year was kind of weird because I only played four events because of the show. So two months, two million. So I didn't really have much time to play any events. And but luckily I forty I came I came in final table forty k for five hundred forty k and then this year um, I played a lot of events I grinded real hard um, and I I mean I was only like one for fourteen or one for seventeen or something like that um, but it was final table like it was the ten k Potlum and Hold'em guys like one hundred sixty k or something. Right, and it, what, what 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 was that experience like? Did you enjoy grinding, or was it just a pain in your ass? No, I, I had fun. I mean, I really like just absolutely terrible in pretty much every other tournament. I had a couple of bubbles, um, but it still was. It felt good. It's kind of refreshing. Like a lot of my friends who are you know cash game players who hardly ever play live tournaments, play like you know three of them or four of them a year. They kind of had no idea what I was doing all summer. Like, why are you why are you putting in all these hours playing like you know. Uh, 2,500 no limits and, and stuff like that. Why don't you just play, just grind cash? Um, but I think part of the reason I like to do it is it's just really refreshing to go from playing, you know, like 2,550 no limit against some of the best Hold'em players in the world or, you know, PLO, and then you get to play in, like, some 2,500 no limit tournament uh, at the Rio with, like, you know, seven complete complete donks uh, <laughs> at your table. So it's 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 nice to actually... Not have to, you know, not have to think really, really hard to make a marginally, you know, plus EV play every every hand. Now, were you playing any live when you were out there? Like any live cash, or do, do, do most of your boys just go there and sort of huddle in their rooms and play online? Um, I played a, a decent amount early on in the summer. Like when there weren't any good events going on, I, I tried to put in some some live cash sessions. But honestly, I, I it kind of just dawned on me the way well first I started playing a lot of live PLO and as slow as live no limit is live PLO is unbelievably slow I was playing 50 100 live at the Rio one day and I, I decided to sit there and actually count and 
for four hours, we averaged 12 hands an hour. Oh. Jesus. <laughs> so Why is that? Are the, are the, I mean, is it, I, mean I, I was slow at an or? exception. No, I was at an exceptionally slow table. There were like several players who were tanking like ridiculous decisions. That was really slow. But still, you're not going to see much, much more than you know, 20 hands an hour ever really. Um, so it's like it doesn't matter how soft it is if you're going to be able to play like 4,000 hands all summer. Like that's just not going to be worth it. Right. Um, right. And obviously, you know, with variance, you're like, you know, what, you know, 55% to even book a win on the summer if you do that. Um, I mean, if you're, it only becomes really worth it, I think, to play live if you're playing really high stakes. Because um, then, obviously, the hourly can, can compare with, with grinding online, grinding online um, being able to play multiple tables, um, and then obviously all the other reasons that online is, is better for, for making money is just, you know, but still, especially when go ahead. But still, even when you guys play like super, super high stakes, it, the 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 variance is so huge, and you're playing such few hands. Is it still just like pure gambling almost? Because you don't get enough hands I mean, to the, offset the beats. Yeah, but the variance is also lower live. You can make more correct decisions. You can. I mean, you're for sure gonna have a higher win rate live. I mean, if you want to talk about it, uh, you know, in in terms of your you know, your big blind per hundred or whatever, it can probably easily be double or, or even triple uh, alive what it, what it would be online. And that's in addition to the fact that it's going to be lower variance, you know, your standard deviation, or whatever is going to be lower. Um, and that all combines for being worth it. Definitely. Even when you're, so if you're playing high stakes um, and also, I mean, you're playing like you, you can play much higher stakes live um, for, if you compare like the, the level of play, you know, I mean, you can play in a really soft, like, 501k no limit game live. <laughs> just can't do that online. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, when I that... say re- when I say really soft, I mean like three of the best poker players in the world, and then like <laughs> one or two rich donks. So it's still tough. And like, if you're not very good, you're gonna get chewed up. But as long as you can like you know hold your own with the better players, and there's gonna be some weak players in, in there, it could definitely be worth it. And it seems like, especially out in Vegas, and maybe even so online, that players that play high like you. It's find the fish, find the rich rich fish. Let's sit at the table and try to tangle with him a little bit and hope he makes a mistake. I mean, is that pretty much what a lot of the high stakes players are doing? Yeah, I mean, don't call me a bum hunter, like, you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not calling you out, but it just seems like, ooh, you know, this prince is playing. Let's sit down there and try I mean, to get yes him for 100k. And no. Yes, and no. I mean, I'm not. Like, I've never really grinded that much live cash um, during the World Series. Um, the times when I've been really dedicated to putting in a lot of like live cash sessions, um, I've just decided, okay, I'm going to go play and I just go play. I don't, you know, have, have, uh, like the floor guy at the Bellagio, uh, text me every time, every time, you know, like the Saudi oil prince or whatever walks into, right. into the room. But, um, I mean, obviously the guys who are, who are, who like live at the Bellagio all summer and are like sitting there grinding 10, 20, 25, 50 all day. I mean, yeah, they're they're pretty much, you know, I wouldn't say breaking even, but you know, not not doing too well most of the time, just just sort of grinding it out, and then occasionally some guy just comes in and decides that he's gonna, you know, sit down with 200k at 25.50 and, and dump it all off, mm. and then it, and then it becomes worth it. Right. No. I, in fact, I was at uh, I was having dinner at Fix during the World Series, and. Patrick Antonius walks by really fast, and then Raptor walks by, like, walking fast as hell in the poker room with his backpack, and I'm like, oh, man, there must be a rich donk that just sat down. I mean, it's like these sharks that just... Or, or maybe Dave right, was just, like, just following Patrick. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. I mean, these guys are like killers. I love it. Hmm. Um, so how was your profile out, out in Las Vegas? I mean, obviously you do two months, two million, where a lot more people recognize you, recognizing you as you're walking around the Rio... What was that experience like? Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I slowly have gotten a little more used to it. Um, it's still a little weird when somebody asks to take their picture with me. I mean, I think it's weird enough when they ask to take a picture with, like, Tom um, or, or any of, like, the other, you know, much bigger guys. Uh, so when they t- – when I, I've had a couple of people come up to me and ask to take a picture with me. I think that's just completely absurd. But, um, I, I mean, I get – you know, this is – the poker world that's that's i guess that's that's what it is um 
it's definitely a little bit weird when you have it in your head that you think people might be looking at you because now anytime I like am in the hallway and I see a bunch of people like, you know, some like young dudes are just staring at me. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. uh, huh. these guys are staring at me. <laughs> it's a little weird. Right. Right. It happens way, you know, qu- quite frequently actually. Now, no, is, it, is it ever any chicks or is it all dudes? It's probably like one out of 20 people that, that have come up to me have been, been a chick. It might happen, you know, some, like, I don't know, 50 times or something since beginning of two months, two million, and probably maybe two or three of them are girls. <laughs> <laughs> right, it stinks. Uh, but is it mostly two months, two million, or is it like uh, your World Series coverage on ESPN? Or now the big game? What's been the number one thing that people have recognized you from? I mean, I don't know. I don't really like ask them when they say like, "Hey, are you Donnie Stern?" I'm not like, I'm not, you know, like, "Hey, where do you know me from?" But uh, <laughs> um, I, I assume most of it's two months to a million. Um, but the 40k was, I mean, they showed it once. It was like a terrible episode. It was so boring. And I don't, they, I don't, I've never seen them playing reruns really. Hmm. Uh, I, I assume it's it's from the uh, it's it's from two months to a million. Right. But I mean I don't know maybe maybe there's some really dedicated ESPN <laughs> poker fans out there. Oh, there definitely are. But why why did two plus two million not come back? I mean I guess at the end of the day it's all about money and ratings. Did they feel like they didn't it wasn't profitable for them? I, I don't even think our ratings were that bad from what the the feedback we were getting during when the show was on. Um, maybe they thought there wasn't going to be that much you know like replay value for a second season. Um, I have to be a little bit calculated in how I want to say this, because um, I want us to come out and say it at some point, but I should probably talk to Jay. But basically, I think that G4 was a little bit incompetent with how they marketed the show and, sure. and a lot of the way the money was spent. Um, and I, I can't really go into too much detail, but I, I don't really think they, they handled it well. Um, and also, you know, I think the show got a lot better as we went on, and I think it would have been better next season if we had a second season. Right. But I mean, I don't mean to sound, you know, I don't mean to sound bitter, um, but I think we all kind of got better at being on the show um, towards the end, and would and would we would have been a lot more comfortable doing it uh, for a second season. The the first, I mean, the first, the beginning of the first season, I, I'll be honest, I was pretty uncomfortable at first. I, I didn't really like it. Um, I was kind of not, you know, feeling it at at the start, and then kind of grew on me and then I got a lot I just got a lot more into it and then it became like second nature to be on the show it was weird when I woke up like the day after it ended and I didn't have to you know <laughs> right like go go put on my sound pack and like all that stuff I was in withdrawal so the obvious question is I why know, I don't know if I really asked answered your question though but no, sorry, sh- no. sure you did but the, the obvious the, the obvious follow-up then is why not just pitch it to other networks I'm assuming you guys did that yeah, well, I mean, we don't own the show. Uh, the producers on the show, mm. um, and I know they're like doing other stuff right now. I don't know. I mean, really, Jay is the person to talk to about all that. I, he's, I think he technically is one of the producers, um, but he doesn't actually own the rights to the show. So, I know he's put in some effort. Um, I mean, it's pretty tough. It was tough enough to get it the first time. I mean, the, the show was like three years in the making before it actually ever aired. You know, it was right. It, it started out as well, it started that some guy did a documentary about the house that those guys were living at like three summers before I was even 21 when I was 20. Somebody did like a five minute documentary piece and they really liked it. And they said, why don't we use this to pitch it to networks? And they pitched it to a bunch of networks and networks sort of gave them the green light to go for a to go uh, and make a pilot episode and they got, you know, some funding to make a pilot and then they made the pilot and had to pitch that again to G4 and they approved it. And then that's when Ariel backed out and, and they needed a replacement. So they auditioned me. (laughs) Um, But it it was just, it it was so long and complicated to get it all done. I mean, that, all that, that timeline I said, that was like three years. Right. So it, it, it's really not just like, you know, knock on the door at like, you know, Spike or MTV and be like, hey, you guys want to do a reality show? Right. Well, right. not that it matters, but what was the final tally? It seemed like, from what I can remember, you started out like you dug a big hole. 670-something, 660-something. I'm not sure exactly. It was like a third of the way. Still pretty sick. And it was yeah, all, not bad. And huh? it was all because you, st- you dug a big hole early, right? 
I mean, I don't think we ever got like really low. Uh, at some point, we might have been we might have been down something less than 100. It was really, I mean, part part of the reason was we didn't really take it that seriously at the beginning <laughs> of the uh, beginning of summer. We kind of, I mean, the way it all started was we, I mean, originally the show was called House of Cards, and sort of a few months before we were going out to Vegas to, to film the the first season. Um, I mean, the only season. Uh, <laughs> they um, they sort of kept alluding to how there's going to be like a, a tagline of something about they have two two months to make two million, and they told us that they had to change the name of the show because uh, they needed or there was some conflict. I think like CNBC had a had some finance show called House of Cards, um, so they had to change it. And there was like a lot of back and forth about what the show was going to be called. And then they decided, they just like told us, they kind of, they asked for our input, what we wanted the show to be called. And we had like a bunch of ideas, you know, some, some pretty stupid ones like, um, you know, millionaire mouse clickers, crap like that. Um, <laughs> and, and then they just told us it's going to be two months, two million, and that we're going to have a goal. And that was sort of just like sprang on us. Um, and so it wasn't like really something we were, that into because it wasn't i mean it, we kind of were just like told this is how like this is going to be like the angle of the show gotcha gotcha now now something uh good that probably did come out of the show was your sponsorship deal correct and you landed that sort of after everything aired how exactly i mean how, what sites were after you why did you choose doyle's room and uh and how, how did that process turn out um i they chose me i guess um it was sort of a com. I I had been in talks with them for a while though, even before the show, because of the 40k final table. I wore their patch during that, and I was talking to them during the tournament. Um, and like again, that's like another thing which takes months to to sort of deal with and and, and you know get everything get everything going. Uh, you know, there's agents, there's agents on the other side, there's just all sorts of BS that you have to go through. Um, it's just kind of a lot of politics and like little, little details of your contract. Um, I, I mean, obviously two months, a million helped. I don't know if I would have gotten it without it, but it did start from the 40 K. Um, and so far it's been a great relationship and happy, happy over there. And it's already, you know, it's already gotten me some, some extra opportunities like being on the big game. Right. Yeah. I want to, I want to ask you about that, but specifically with your deal with Doyle's room without going into like the financial aspects or anything, you're obviously allowed to play other sites and all those things. Is that something that was uh, like non-negotiable with you? Did they try to get some sort of exclusive deal with you? How does that work? No, they don't have any exclusive deals with any of the, the Brunson 10. Um, they, you know, they understand that we're all professional players and that there's a lot of action on stars and full tilt. Um, and if you want to play high stakes, you know, for a living, I can't just like only rely on Doyle's room, although there actually has been some good action lately. Um, so it wasn't really, it wasn't really a question about, about there being an exclusive deal. Hmm. Now you mentioned the big game and, and, and that's generated a, a lot of interest, certainly in the poker community. And I know you came out a big winner there. I've only seen a few of the hands online. I saw you put Phil on tilt, I think at least twice. I know the one where you caught the straight on the turn. Uh, con continuous. Yeah. Right. What, what? Right. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a headline here, Eric, and it's uh, from Poker News. Yeah. Donnie Stern demolishes the competition. So not a bad article, right? I mean, he finished off, what, 185K? Yeah. It's just a dominating performance of 150 hands. <laughs> yeah, how does that work? When I read that, you know, I, I get up early, so I haven't seen many episodes of it. But, you know, the game lasts 150 hands. I mean, you're in and you're out, right? I mean, how long does the session take to film? Um, you know, in the total filming was something like 10 hours, but, you know, it goes a lot slower because it's a TV show and there's a whole production and we took breaks every, you know, every, between each you know, day. Um, and then we had like a lunch break and all that. So, I mean, in, in terms of, uh, I don't know how much time we were actually sitting there playing for, um, but like, you know, like it's, just, it's a big spectacle. So they, they have a lot of, a lot of stuff to do. And, and it seemed like you were getting some pleasure and everybody obviously they want, they want to see Phil go off. What was he like uh, when the cameras were off? Was he clearly turning it on when when the red light came on and doing his whole routine? 
You know, I'm, I'm not really sure with him. Going into that, I, I hadn't really played with him. I played with him like two or three years ago in, in Aruba, I think, for like just a few hands. Uh, so I didn't really have much experience with him, uh, live at least. I, I played with him online. Um, and I went into it assuming that it was all kind of an act, that he was, you know, he does it for the cameras, he does it for, to, you know, make a name for himself and obviously his work. But during the show, I kind of get the feeling that it really was, that was really him, that he actually <laughs> right. was, was, he was, that was him. Because, I mean, he like turned bright red, he was sweating, he was just like, he was, I re- he really looked like, like he was going to kill himself, like he was just, he was hysterical. Right. He was like, just, he couldn't control himself. Um, so, I mean, I, it's, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. I, I, I think he really is like that, basically. Right. Now, did it piss you off? Did you want to sort of come back at him, or are you sort of like everyone else and just sort of laugh at him and realize it's Phil being Phil? I mean, I, I guess I came back at him. That's what everyone seems to think. I mean, I guess that's what happened. Um, but at the same time, it's not its not like some passionate animosity or anything. It's just, you know, like if you're going to be a, a, a dick, I'm going to be a dick. Just, you know, um, I, I don't, you know, I don't have any like personal distaste or anything. I don't have like any lingering hate about it or anything like that. Um, if if I saw him again, I'd be happy to you know shake his hand and have a drink with him or whatever and and, and just get on with it. Um, but at the same time, if we were at the same table again and he and he you know calls me an idiot, <laughs> I'm gonna call him an idiot back. <laughs> it's not you know. I'm not going to just sort of, you know, roll my eyes and go, oh, it's Phil Helmut. It's okay. Right, right. It's like, why, why is it okay? He's 45 years old. Right. Or 30 years, <laughs> 40 years old, whatever. Who else was with you? I, I saw Daniel was at your table. Was Prahlad at your table? Yeah, uh, it was Daniel, Prahlad, uh, Eugene Kachilov, and then the uh, loose cannon who was replaced by Jason Mercier. Oh, Okay. Gotcha. And then, so, did anybody else uh, set him off while you were there, or were you pretty much the guy? I mean, Daniel was kind of like the agitator. Right. He, he, he was, he was kind of provoking him, provoking me to provoke him. Um, he was kind of just needling him the whole time. Uh, I mean, they were going back and forth at each other. They had, they had a lot of banter. Um, it, for the most part, was kind of just joking around. And then towards the end, it got a little bit more serious. After that King's Hand that I won, he, uh, Daniel kind of was needling him a bit. And after the Queen's Hand Hand I won, he kind of gave it to him a little bit. Um, but, I mean, he has so much history with, with Daniel right. that, he, it, they, you know, they have, their own, they have their own dynamic. I think he was much angrier at me because, you know, I was like this, you know, new punk internet kid. So Right. The one thing that jumped that was, out at me was how fucking hot Manda Leatherman looked. Uh, right. I haven't met her in person yet, and we've been out to Vegas during the World Series for like three years. Brett says we ran into her like at Starbucks, but I don't think we did. Maybe we did. She looked fucking well, yeah, that stunning. Couple, that, was a couple, that was a couple years ago. She just looked like sort of a young, skinny chick, but I think she's sort of she come into her own lately. Yeah, oh, yeah. Is that an accurate perception? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean... She looks good in person, yeah. <laughs> was was Daniel hollering when you were there? Was Daniel or they like you know, making I was, out? I, I was on the nothing we're making out. Um, <laughs> I was on the I was on the two plus two poker cast last night and yeah. they asked me the same question. They're like, Was Daniel trying to you know was was he was he trying to get in there? Was he already getting in there? <laughs> I I really wasn't, you know, I didn't have my, my eye on the two of them. I wasn't, you know, trying to trying to scope them out. But they, I mean they seemed friendly, they seemed like they knew each other. Um, I didn't see any, you know, ass grabs or anything like that, though. <laughs> when was it recorded? About uh, four months ago or so, something like that. Um, yeah, May I think. Right. I was probably right as they were, right as they were probably getting together. I imagine. Hey, I want to ask you about uh, your flag football team because you're on the, you play on a flag football team with uh, Phil Galfond and Mikey Stotts, who's been on uh who's all over poker static now apparently he, he put this in an email that you were the quarterback for uh, you know a, a couple different plays we threw two interceptions 
Mikey replaced you, and he went like five for six with a with a couple TDs. That's fucking bullshit. How <laughs> about that? Is there like a quarterback uh, we, controversy? We, well, we we share time. Um, I'd say I'd say he's 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 a better decision maker than I am, but I probably have a better arm than him. Um, you know, I'm I'm he's like Chad Pennington. I'm Brett Favre. <laughs> um, but he. Uh, I mean, he. I don't know. We'll see. We have our season starting in, in like a week and a half or two weeks or something like that. Um, it's just like half of the team's poker players. I mean, it's not like you know serious business or anything. It's like a kind of a joke league. Right. But we do right. have you know we do have uniforms and refs, so it counts for some, I guess. Now, can you attest to the yeah. Galfon speed that Mikey was bragging about uh, a couple months ago? Yeah. He, no, he's he's a beast on defense. He's really good. Um, he he got a bunch of picks last season. Um, and you know, not surprisingly, obviously he's like a really smart player. You know, when we <laughs> when we're like plan, planning stuff out, he's always got like the plays and the the defensive <laughs> strategy and and how to exploit their team. And he always he always cracks the other team's uh, code for what their plays are going to be. He always he's always like onto them. Of course, when, he's... And, you know, when it's like oh, when they say three seventy three, listen to the last digit. If it's odd, they're going this. If it's even they're doing that. Like, <laughs> uh, so he's reading them. He's reading them perfectly. I'm not shocked. That's yeah. hilarious. That's hilarious. You know what? Like a major league team needs to hire him to be like the bench coach and steal signs in baseball, right? He'd be perfect Seriously. for that. Yeah, uh, he'd be, I think he. I think he. He'd work at that. They probably couldn't pay him enough, though, to tell you the truth. <laughs> That's for I mean, sure. Let's be honest. Hey, uh, what's your take on the Dirt Challenge? You know, Dirt, Dirt, Jungleman. They're going at it back and forth. Um, from talking to people, I mean, obviously, Durr is one of the best players in the world. Do you think he has a chance to lose this? What, what, what's your take on the uh, on yeah, this match? I think, I think Jungle Man is definitely a favorite. I mean, he's a big favorite at this point with his, the lead that he has. Um, I think the line, unless, the last I checked, that unless they played since last time I checked, um, the line in high stakes and now that was going back and forth was, was, um, was Jungle Man, like, minus 210, I think. Um and he's up what like 700 or something, 750, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think he was a favorite from the start. Uh, I put a little money on him. Um, uh, no disrespect to Tom at all. I think Tom's really good, but I mean, I think it's definitely possible that John Lynn's the best in the world at heads up no limit. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you just look at, at what he's done. It's he's built this you know huge bankroll playing almost exclusively the toughest no-limit players in the world, heads up. He's just destroyed everyone. Um, I mean, a couple people, I guess, have done well against him, but he, you know, he's basically made a living playing heads up, no limit, played hundreds of thousands of hands in the last couple of years, playing just heads up, no limit, um, pretty much no other game. Like, he doesn't even play six max. Um, he's recently started playing PLO, but almost all of his play, 95% of his play is heads up, no limit, heads up, no limit. And Tom... You know, he's been the best for a while at a lot of, you know, at no limit PLO and, and, and six nights, but he just doesn't play that much heads up no limit. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't get the, the, the practice of just like four tabling and just battling somebody for hours and hours and hours like Jungle Man has just been doing for the last two years. Um, I don't know who would be favored if, you know, if that was what Tom had been doing for the last two years of his life. Um, if he hadn't been, you know, focusing on, on those bleed games and, and, and learning different games and PLO and, and six max games and all that. Um, I, it's just, I just think it's something that's really hard to overcome is that John is basically a heads up specialist. He's really, really good at specifically the game that they're playing. Um, and Tom might be the overall better poker player, but it doesn't really matter. Hmm. Why don't you give us your have ranking you, you... Of, of the best uh, no limit players in the world right now? Now you're focusing on PLO, but g give us your top five who jump out at you. You know, heads up, no limit. Sure. Um, Jungle Man. Um, uh, Fish Eye or Observer eighty four, whatever. Um, I, I probably yes, those are. I never played him, but you got. I just assume he has to be. Um, he has to be that good. And he seemed like he he was. I mean, from what from what I watched, he seemed like he was very good. Um, those are the three that jump out at me right away. Um, 
probably a little bit of a drop off after that. I don't I don't really know who else I'd put up there. What about in PLO? Can you give us a similar list in PLO? Heads up PLO. Um, you know I can tell. It's, it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, I haven't been playing PLO nearly as long as I've played No Limit. I've been playing No Limit for like five years, playing high stakes for like three and a half, four years now. Um, but PLO is much newer to me, um, so it's, I, I don't have the experience as much experience with all the players. Um, but again, names that would jump out at me would be for heads of PLO, probably Tom, um, maybe Patrick. I don't. I don't really know. I never played in PLO. Uh, um, Phil and Phil, <laughs> probably both of them. Um, I mean, those are all the nosebleed guys, but I haven't really played much nosebleed PLO. Right. Now, you kind of – I remember we interviewed you on Mediocre Poker Radio about a year or so ago, and you were really – I mean, you were breaking my balls for, like, playing full ring and being a pussy, and you're like, I was complaining I can't win anymore. And you're like, play, play no, no limit, pussy, you know. That was that was always sort of your thing. Is that how you're taking on PLO? Are you playing a lot of six max PLO? Heads heads up. What's your deal? I mean, I'm just playing whatever I can play, basically. Uh, I'm playing a lot of time. I'm playing both, you know, heads up and six max at the same time. Um, it, it's just really refreshing playing PLO that you actually sit down at a heads up table and somebody will sit there and play you. It's not like No Limit where you sit there for 40 straight hours. And nobody comes to play you. And there's, you know, 200 bum hunters sitting there waiting for one fish to show up and, and for somebody to take him out. Um, people actually are playing each other in PLO. It's, still, you know, it's a, a newer game, um, at least in, you know, in online. And there's, there's, you know, people, people are actually gambling up and playing each other. On, you know, it's not, not as nitty as, as no limit is these days with game selection. Do you, st- do you still enjoy? playing poker for a living like sitting there and actually playing online or is it something where you just have to pay the bills and I, and I have to grind it out I mean I don't have like the passion that I used to when I you know three years ago when I was sort of really like building up my bankroll and starting to play like really tough players and and you know started to sort of establish myself I was so into it and just I had such such a desire to get better and I you know I was just so unprepared for what could happen you know you know how good can I get how much money can I make and then you know it sort of dies down after a while um probably came close to my ceiling in no limit not that I don't think I'll get better but I'm not going to get that much better relative to the field basically um and there are a lot of players better than me in no limit now um where there were much fewer back in the day um, but PLO is changing that a little bit for me because I'm still I'm still definitely in the, like the learning phase. I mean, you're always in the learning phase in poker, but you know it's still a little bit more in its infancy for me. PLO. I mean, I've been playing it for like a couple of years, but I've only been really, really been grinding it um, probably like the last like six to eight months, and just try. You know, I'm just I'm studying it so hard. You know, I'm, I'm doing lots of. Um, I mean, I'm sending hands to pretty much everyone whose opinion I respect, like 10 of them a day. I'm reviewing my hands. I'm doing lots of, you know, equity calculations, just doing lots of stuff like that, trying to review my opponents. Um, and that's partly sort of how I was, you know, how I felt about No Limit three, three four years ago, whatever. Um, and now since PLO is kind of new, it, it sort of reignited a bit of a passion. Um, and also, when I was like 19 or 20, and if I had like a really big day, I would just take a few days off. I just didn't care. I was like, oh, I'm so rich, blah, 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 <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, but now, um, you know, I'm more of an adult, and I feel more like, you know, I feel guilty if I just sit on the couch all day and don't do anything, if I don't play some poker. You know, if there's games out there and there's people making money, I feel guilty if I'm not, you know, getting in on it and, you know, doing my job basically I know you were quoted in the past as saying if you see me playing I'm probably crushing it and if you see me just playing little 30 minute sessions here and there every few days then I'm probably getting my ass kicked is that still That's true or is true. that is that has that changed yeah I mean it's true I try to take a little bit of the IV approach that if you start getting crushed don't sit there and just get buried for like 40 buy-ins in a session um, it's 
you know, you're very rarely going to be playing your A game if you're down, you know, seven or eight buy-ins or, or anything like that. I mean, obviously, I'll make exceptions if I'm if I'm in unbelievably good games. It doesn't matter how much I get stuck. I'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna quit. Um, but if I'm in, you know, just mediocre games where I have a small edge and I'm starting to get crushed, I'll I'll just stop. I have no problem doing that. Hmm. How do you, how do you not let it ruin the rest of your day? If you lose 40k, 50k, 100k, whatever it is, how do you not yell at your girlfriend? How do you not just well, who, you know what I mean? Who who says I don't? Well, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would ruin <laughs> mine. Point. It would ruin mine. She deserves I mean, to be yelled at. <laughs> it's it sometimes. I mean, it sometimes ruins the day. I mean, sometimes it doesn't. It depends, you know. I mean, if, I, if I'm up like 100K in the week and I lose 50 in the last day of the week, I'll be pissed. You know, I'll be pissed, but I'm not going to I'm not gonna kill anyone. Um, if it's like my eighth losing day in a row, I'm going to be in a pretty bad mood that day. Right. So it's all, you know, I mean, and, and you know, obviously the more it happens, the more you get desensitized. So nothing really phases me anymore. Though I still definitely get into bad moods if, if, I'm getting, if I'm just getting buried. Right. One thing that we talked about, and you talk about, um, you know, sharing your hands, and you got like, I don't know, you might, you re, it sounds like you're really grinding now. You might ship ten hands a day to somebody or to, to a group of guys and have them review it, guys that you respect. But you're not doing that anymore on two plus two. I looked, I looked your name up. I wanted to see all your posts, and you had some random post that you were pissed off at bum hunters that let you start a table, and then they get position on you and sit out and wait till the fish sits and that you know makes a lot of sense to me but i didn't see a lot of uh strategy posts from you recently why is that there's just no upside anymore there's no real reason to to make strategy posts um if i need to ask people you know how to play a hand and i post it in like high stakes nl 90% of the replies are going to be from people who don't even play high stakes nl and the guys who do play, who I actually play with on a daily basis, are not going to want to answer my question. They're not going to, you know, if I, you know, how do I play this, you know, pocket jack against nuts and all. And, you know, it's not like, first of all, his friends are going to come in and tell me how to play against him. It's not like he's going to tell me how to play against him. And then, and then you know, all the, the guys in between, the, just the random high stakes and L players, why would, they have, why would they want to help me get better? I mean, there's just no, no, no incentive whatsoever for them to do it. Um, and then... On the flip side, you know, I'm paid to discuss strategy on on Deuces Crack, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna just give it up for free uh, on Two Plus Two. The thing is about Two Plus Two is that it used to be like this great community of give and take, and and I learned so much uh, poker there early on in my career, and I gave so much back. I really did. Um, I you know I posted strategy in in in, in the tournament section and high stakes and all the time. But it, it's just so massive now, and there's just so much, just so much riffraff that it, it, it just sort of, I mean, it's, it's not better or worse than it used to be. And, and like, overall, it's just different. It's, it's not what it was. It's not like there's active strategy for high stakes anymore. Right. I, I, you know, if I want to talk about poker, I can, I have, you know, I have like 10 people on my, you know, on my Gchat or my Skype or whatever whose opinions I all you know respect greatly, and I can just talk to them without publishing my thoughts, basically. Right. Now, of course, you are an instructor at Deuces Cracked. What about personal coaching? Do you have do you have students that you take on? What do you charge hourly? Uh, um, yeah, I have, I have I keep usually about four or five students at a time. Um, I probably do about maybe five hours of coaching a week. Um, and I charge, depending on how many sessions you book, somewhere between like five and six hundred dollars an hour. Um, and yeah, I mean, most of them, most of them play on on European sites, so I don't feel too bad about dirtying the waters that I'm swimming in. But <laughs> occasion, I have had students, my previous students, who I started coaching them when they were playing like two four, and then you know they're playing me heads up twenty five fifty no limit like a year later. <laughs> <laughs> It's, but with all those guys, it was almost it, what I coached them was almost useless. They were they were gonna get there no matter what anyway. Right. Yeah. Do most of your students do all of your students flourish, or, or are there a couple that are like, you know, this guy's helpless. He's a donk. <laughs> um, almost all of them, I think, definitely improved from from my coaching. And, and if they don't move up, they at least you know increase their win rate at at the games that they're playing. 
Um, some people just have a certain uh, problem in the way they think about poker that, you know, you can try all you want to get them not to think about it like that, but, it, it, you know, if it's just too ingrained into their head, it's, it's going to be really hard. Um, you know, a lot of times, like, I'd say the most common type of student I have is, like, a 2-4 or 3-6 grinder who play his, you know, like, 16 or, or 20 tables or something like that, and it's just a robot and wants me to help them, you know, learn to expand their game a little bit and, and, and get, just be a little bit more aggressive, a little bit looser, um, be able to be able to play against against winning players and be able to beat, you know, really tough opponents. The only way to do that is, is limit the tables and really have them focus and concentrate though, right? Yeah, I mean, but it depends on what you're really looking for. I mean, I know there are guys who grind like two, four, no limit and, and make a quarter million dollars a year. Um, and they just put in the hours and, you know, it's, it's relatively low variance and it's, it's just not, you know, it's not for everyone to, to move up. It's not for everyone to, to want to play high stakes or to want to play like heads up against really tough opponents. It's just, yeah, everybody has their own preferences in, for what they want out of poker. Right. Nice. Well, listen, thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate it. Um, where are we going to see you next? Are you playing any tournaments? Are you just going to be at home grinding? I'll probably play like all those Bellagio tournaments in the fall. Um, probably going to do Aussie Millions. Um, right now, I've just been grinding like like mad. Um, so I guess that tells you how I've been doing if I've been playing a lot. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just I'm I'm chilling at home for now, and and probably going to do a little traveling in a couple months. But I'm just focusing online right now. Very nice. Very nice. Good deal, man. Well, well, thanks for joining us on the uh, Poker Static Hot Seat, and we'll have to get you on again soon. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, buddy. All right, man. See ya. Thanks a lot, to Donnie. I appreciate it, man. Cool. Is it um, good? Yeah. Yeah, that no, was really good. Perfect. Always good. Perfect. Let me save it here. We got it. When, when, you, did, when you did that uh, that radio interview,